Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to welcome you all to the second of four webinars in UCI Division of Continuing Education's 11th Annual GATE webinar series. Today's topic is Inquiry PBL and the Gifted Student. This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to the UCI Division of Continuing Education On Demand Recordings page. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Below is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I will provide you with information about several GATE resources offered through UCI DCE, including our fully online GATE Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins April 1st. I will then hand it over to Vanessa Heller as she will be presenting on today's topic, Inquiry PBL and the Gifted Student. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send me any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John from UCI Support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Vanessa regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel and we will um, address it either during the presentation itself or if we have a few minutes at the end. Now, when you, when you view the chat panel, you wanna make sure that you send your questions to all panelists and all attendees. We have opened up the chat panel so that everybody can see each other's questions and hopefully we can get a good dialogue going there. Here's a brief overview of our GATE Specialized Studies program. It is offered fully online and consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed request for certificate. The courses in the program range from $375 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value, and you can take individual courses without pursuing the entire program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make up our GATE program. The topics covered in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of this diverse group of students. Now, when you are viewing the course schedule pictured here, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates how long each course will last as well as the course fee. So as an example, differentiated instruction, a three unit course costs $500 and will last for 10 weeks online, while identification and programming, a one unit course, costs $375 and will last for three weeks online. With our program, you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months, and you can choose elective topics that are of greatest interest to you. Here's a list of the courses that we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter. For the required course, differentiated instruction, and for the elective course, engaging students through technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. And we do encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of an online course. This slide shows a special offer um, that we are providing all webinar attendees. You can receive a 10% discount on online courses in the GATE Specialized Studies program during the spring quarter, which is the upcoming quarter, um, by using the discount code GATE10. So you will be able to use that discount code if you call in to our student services office to register, or you can enter that code in the discount code field when registering online. Please note that the offer does expire May 9th, so you will wanna make sure that you enroll using that code before that date. As you may already know, UCI DCE hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Feel free to follow directions on this slide to become a member and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE. And all of the recordings of our past webinars, so we're currently on our 11th annual webinar series, so we have a bunch of webinar recordings housed in that community that are available um, by joining. 
UCI DCE also provides individual courses, specialized in-services, and the entire GATE Specialized Studies program on-site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. Depending on the cohort size, we offer 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. If you want to learn more about our program and discuss your GATE training and PD needs, please feel free to contact me. To wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any additional questions. Today's presenter is Vanessa Heller. Vanessa has been an educator for over 20 years and currently teaches middle school humanities for Oak Park Unified. She also serves as director of the Oak Park Inquiry Institute district peer coach, a district innovator, helping colleagues incorporate technology into their teaching, and the middle school ELA department chair. She regularly presents on best practices in gifted education and inquiry at conferences throughout California. We're very excited to have her logged in today to present on the topic, Inquiry PBL and the Gifted Student. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand the remote control over to Vanessa so that she can further introduce herself and begin her portion of the presentation. Vanessa, can you hear us okay? I can hear you, can you hear me? Wonderful, sounds good. Woo. All right, hi everybody, welcome. Uh, to those of you who are able to uh, be live with me today, and of course a special shout out to those of you who will be catching us later in the recorded version. Um, welcome to Inquiry and PBL and the Gifted Student. You can call us problem-based learning or project-based learning if you'd like, I'll clarify that later. Um, just so you know, Inquiry and PBL is an approach for all students, but it's particularly well suited for the gifted child. We will cover Inquiry and PBL at its essence, its basic elements to respect your time. And because it really is a very heady topic, we will, we will glean over the phases of it. I will be incorporating the depth and complexity icons. I will be including the content imperatives with a heavy dose of the universal themes, which Hillary Wolcott so deftly covered last week. We will um, cover those again briefly, but um, more integrated since she introduced them to you. If you have questions, I will definitely try to address them um, as we go on with the session. If not, like uh, Lisa said, you can um, contact her you can DM me on Twitter, you can email me, I will get back to you tonight. Uh, and I, I'm happy to share anything you wanna know, I will share it with you. Make sure I can do this here. There we go. All right, uh, Lisa introduced me so I won't um, go on and on about the basics. Uh, I think what's mo most important to know is that I'm a recovering gifted child. That is my quote. I apparently, if you are a gifted child, you end up being a gifted adult, but it doesn't seem proper etiquette to say so. I'm also the parent of gifted children, so uh, I live and breathe this. And again, my contact information is here. Uh, I'm not being snarky, held to teach is in reference to my last name, but it is a tad subversive, which makes me tickle. So while I'm not gonna read every slide to you, I think it's important that I go over this one in particular because inquiry is a very hands-on approach. It's very minds-on. It approaches um, learning, in a non-traditional way that I think is very valuable and very necessary today. And it really promotes critical thinking. And if you've been teaching public school as long as I have, critical thinking is an area where we, we really need to address and promote more within our instructional program. Inquiry and PBL is for all students, but particularly the gifted learner truly blossoms in this culture of higher level thinking. And this is where differentiation lies. This is where the challenge lies. And so I have just found it to be very successful with all my students when it's done correctly. And um, gifted kids really do flourish because it honors their voice, it honors their choice, and it is differentiation made easy and naturally. And I'm all for that because I am a teacher and I teach all sorts of students and I have to get everyone achieving to their best potential. And we can't really go any further without understanding what inquiry is. And in its essence, it is a question. It is a desire to know, a de desire to find out. It is a problem to solve. It is a need to meet. And often this comes in the form of student complaints. Um, never brush off a student complaint. Ask more questions about it. You have to uh, inquire as well. And inquiry has its foundations in the medical field. 
It's also very, very similar, if not the same, to the scientific method. And honestly, it is a child's natural curiosity that over the years um, in, in public school, we tend to squelch that. And that is something that I feel strongly about. And through inquiry, you re-engage that child's natural curiosity and you help that child pursue it in a structured way that is very freeing. And I, and I realize that sounds like a paradox in itself, but it, it, it does work. It's a really nice balance. Really quickly, I want to clarify for you the difference between inquiry and PBL. I will use inquiry most often as a term because PBL can stand for problem-based learning or project-based learning. I have found that when teachers refer to PBL as project-based learning, their results tend to smack of theme teaching. And what I mean by that is teachers may end up having students make a thing instead of making an impact or coming up with a new idea. Uh, making a poster as your final product or making a model is not doing inquiry. That may be one of the products you produce, but that is not the reason you are pursuing a question or trying to solve a problem. So I prefer to call it problem-based learning or even better inquiry. And we can, you know, have an argument with that, but I'll agree with myself. Well, and I'm very snarky, by the way. Hi, everybody. So the deal is this, is you as a teacher really have to embrace the idea of inquiry. You have to take your own inquiry stance. You have to learn to ask questions and not answer them so many times. We are not the experts. We should not come off as experts. Students will expect you to be experts, of course. But more importantly, we need to put that thinking on the students. Um, you know, there's the saying, whoever's doing the thinking in the room is doing the most work. Don't let that be you. You want the, the student to do the most work and the most thinking. And if you don't approach your teaching with an inquiry stance, if you don't favor questions over directions, their voice over yours, the process of researching, of thinking, of asking, of making, and of doing, if you don't have a thoughtful structure, if you're not intentional about your teaching and their learning, you are really doing all students a disservice and with the gifted child if you've had many gifted students in your career they will sniff out artifice immediately they will call you on your artifice so know what you're doing be open be creative and and ask and expect them to learn and do they gifted kids have some wonderful characteristics that can bug you, but I will tell you through inquiry, you can honor their their special quirks and characteristics and personality and really need to explore their passions. And this is a great way to do it. Oh yeah, and while hitting all curriculum standards too, I promise. What I'd love to know if you guys can um, answer in the chat box, I would love to hear from you, is where you are with inquiry. So if you think about we're at the beach together, are you standing on the shore and you're not quite sure if you can stick your toe in? So are you new? Um, are you sticking your toe in the water? Are, are you new to inquiry? You're trying a few things out? Or did you, have you already dived in? Um, Trevor McKenzie is a great inquiry author. He says, dive into inquiry. Are you in swimming about? So I'd love to know if you can um, chime in, if you can let me know where you are with inquiry. Um, and wherever you are in the process, I want you to know that it is doable. It is scalable to the time that you have, and I'm aware that as a teacher you never have enough time, your comfort level with inquiry, and your ability level, your student's ability level. I will tell you that there are years uh, when I have certain demands in my personal life or my curricular life at work where I can only do so much. If nothing else, if you are on the beach, I see someone is on the beach, if you just learn to ask better questions, I'm stoked. Your kids will be stoked because they start approaching things with a more inquisitive stance. We have someone waist deep, so this will be a nice refresher for you and hopefully give you a little boost to uh, get your head underwater and swim about and look at some of the cool fish. Um, if you're, you just got to the beach, well, good for you because, girl, guy, unpack. We're, we're going to take a swim by the end of this. 
and um, just put on some sunscreen. We'll, we'll get you going. So, like I said, today's an overview. Inquiry is doable, and it, what's nice about it is it blends with everything you already are doing, your standards of content, your um, common core standards. You have a special ed cluster, a gifted cluster, you have uh, English language learners. The, the approaches, especially combined with Kaplan's depth and complexity icons, content imperatives, universal theme, I do these with all my students, no matter what their level or uh, whatever special population is. So, and the thing is you can implement it immediately. So if you're on the beach and you're just watching the uh, swimmers go by, just start asking questions and we're, and we're good to go with that. Okay, and so I, I do appreciate you guys telling me where you are. These are some of the wonderful qualities about inquiry that particularly benefit um, gifted children. I'm going to tell you they demand these things as well. Um, inquiry does focus on group work and building a sense of community is so important in your classrooms and we all do try to do that but it's not just something that you do with a few lessons at the beginning of the year and, and cross your fingers the kids remember to behave. It is a purposeful building of community. It is constant critical thinking. It is learning how to communicate and we'll talk about this in a little bit how to communicate respectfully and that includes disagree um, if you know the gifted child he or she will be very certain that he or she is correct at all times and that you couldn't possibly know what you're doing so teaching the kids how to communicate in a way that others want to hear you is a huge skill and that is something that um, is ingrained in inquiry and that goes along with collaborating how do you work together um, not just sticking the gifted kid with other kids to tutor them. I, I'm not a fan of that. It is how do we use inquiry to play to each child's strengths and talents and share those, which implies creativity. It implies being a good citizen, and we'll get to some of the class norms we'll establish later. And above all, it uh, inquiry really requires students to choose. It requires the teacher to allow for choice and voice where that does sound oxymoronic for a teacher to allow choice, but um, that's where the structure comes in, in the inquiry process. So I really think the gifted child can benefit from this. And these are really high level skills. If you're familiar with the four C's, I just put lots of C's on there because you can't have enough C's. And again, if you have questions, let me know if I'm rambling. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd show you a really overwhelming slide and I overwhelmed you on purpose because I think, you know, why not? I can't see you, so might as well just pretend what you look like all terrified looking at this slide. Um, there are many models of inquiry or PDL, uh, including ones called design thinking. A lot of people are familiar with the Buck Institute that's on the top left. Uh, they're now called PBL Works, in case you didn't know. But uh, they're the industry standard. They have an extensive website. Everything's free, just so you know. Um, a very nice structured way to approach PBL, and they do call it project-based learning, but you can just deal with that. I was raised on the Critical Thinking Institute at uh, UCLA, and but I'm a huge fan of Stephanie Harvey and Harvey Daniels' um, model of inquiry as well. But wait, there's more. There's also design thinking. So I, I, I'm not going to belabor this slide. There's so many models. If you need your hand held a little bit, you need to read more, this slide is for you. But what I've done for you is I boiled it down. I don't really think you need to handhold a model. What I need you to know is because this is doable, there's some common elements to any model, and I have researched many for you and for myself, frankly. They all begin with curiosity, that desire to know, or empathy. You have students who see something, feel something, and, and it's unsettling to them or they see something that's not fair, they experience something that's not fair, and that anger should drive them. And that's when I said earlier, inquiry might begin with a complaint. They are upset about something, they don't like something, and your job is to say, well, what are you gonna do about it? That becomes your driving question, that problem to solve, that need to meet. And the guts of the matter is to find out, and that is your content and standards, that's your research, that's your explicit direct instruction then you are verifying your evidence, you're testing out your prototypes, you're refining your findings and drawing your conclusions. And then you do something, you demonstrate that knowledge, you make a change, you solve that problem. And when you do get the 
presentation from Lisa, there will be some links you can click on, such as the one um, where it says change here, just some ideas for service learning and civic action, because I, like I said earlier, I'm really about students not making a thing, not making a product necessarily, but really making a change and, and really trying to do something for others, whether it's their peers or others in their community or, or even the world. And, and for gifted kids, it's such a wonderful way to do more and be more outside of the classroom. So again, if you have questions, let me know, because I'm going to get right into it. Before you begin anything, you need to know environment matters. And for me, this is really step one. And this is what we all do at the beginning of the year. We set up our classrooms and we put work on the walls. But the question for you is, do students see themselves represented in their classroom? Is there work on the wall? And I'm going to say, is there a progression of work? And maybe not even calling it work, but calling it a demonstration of their learning, of their progress in learning images, writing, quotes, wonderings. Is it a safe place for them to be? If a student doesn't feel safe, they won't participate. They won't participate mentally, they will not participate physically, and I think we all know that. Setting norms and expectations um, in a way that the students are safe to risk, and that literally means just raising their hand to ask for help. Um, and if you know gifted kids, they sometimes, there's something called the imposter syndrome, where they don't want to make a mistake because they are assumed to be genius level across the board in every area. And if you know anything about the gifted clubs, I keep saying, um, and asynchronous with them, they're usually very high in one area and they need help in others. So they need to feel safe to make mistakes. Do they have an area to be quiet, uh, an area of comfort? And is everything labeled, accessed, routines? And we all know these things as educators, but trying to take these these items, but look at them through a student's eyes. Having the, the kids co-create these systems and routines with you. And you'd be surprised how much you cut down on classroom management for all students when they take ownership in what we're doing. So setting up the environment um, to really help the students pick up on the social cues and, and just not only have a clear mental space, but have a clear physical space as well. As far as creating that classroom culture, you're going to do some lessons at the beginning of the year and revisit them during the year where you are going to work on team building. And there's tons of team building exercises um, and really fun activities, content related or otherwise. If you email me, I'll give you a bunch. Um, working your cooperative learning and social skills. I'm going to really highlight scholarly discussion and accountable talk. If you are familiar with scholarly discussion, think of it this way. It is how a scholar, a learned professional communicates. It is speaking properly, it's eye contact, it's using specific words, precise language, and then you can give them to the kids on sentence stems. I have frames in the center of my table where I have these sentence stems, so when we do participate and have a discussion, they have that help there, they have that scaffolding there. Also, how to disagree agreeably how to give a point, make a counterpoint. These are all things that encourage discussion and teach social skills to those who need. And when we're talking differentiation, the way that you group students is critically important. Students can work alone in inquiry, but they can also work with groups, groups by interest, groups by ability. These should be flexible groups, groups based on interest, and that's where a lot of your differentiation is going to come in and honoring what the students need at that particular time. And that's really gonna help create that culture. The picture I have here is a really simple activity I do at the beginning of the year about what a good classmate is or isn't, what they look like, obviously not physical characteristics. Are they attentive? Did, are they leaning in to listen as opposed to you know, slouching in their seat, disinterested? What they are not. So you have examples and non-examples as well. And from that, we actually end up creating a classroom constitution as a legally binding document, you know, I'm talking my legally binding document, of course, um, and it, the kids draw up the, the constitution to which they all sign, and we can reference it when anyone um, is in breach of contract, so to speak. They all have a printed copy, it's posted in the room, and it's a really neat way to get buy-in. Um, quickly, I want to address, um, someone asked what the syndrome was called, it's called imposter syndrome where a gifted child 
doesn't believe they're really as smart as everyone says they are. Um, it can put a lot of pressure on them, and I can um, look up Dr. James Webb, and there's some really great authors I can hook you up with later if you remind me, okay? But it's called imposter syndrome, and a lot of gifted kids will suffer from that. Um, men to put a lot of pressure on themselves. All right, love this slide, and I know it looks overwhelming, but I did it on purpose because, well, that's how I roll. Okay, so you want to get kids engaged. I know this is a big surprise, right? But um, before you start a lesson, don't just give the vocabulary, don't just give a worksheet, do something to pique their interest. What could you do to get maximum buy-in without showing your hand? And this is, this is my motto, never show your hand. The kids know that Mrs. Heller always has something up her sleeve, she always, ha always has an evil plan somewhere, and it just would not be fun if I told them what I'm up to. So when I taught my systems unit in science, we played Jenga. Why? Because subsystems work together as a whole system. If one part of a system is malfunctioning, the entire system breaks down. They don't know what I'm getting at, but right now we're playing Jenga to, oh, maybe draw some preliminary conclusions that we will revisit later when I ask, so why do we play Jenga? Now that we know about systems, which is a universal theme, why did Mrs. Heller make you do that? Or you could have, if you're a science teacher, why don't you have the students do the lab before they know anything? Okay, why are the chemicals reacting like they are? Please talk about lab safety. Or why can't they watch a process such as a scientific experiment with the sound off, where no one's talking, they don't have any idea what's going on, and they have to make some assumptions, draw some hypotheses, unfounded of course. And then once they learn, they will have a deeper understanding of what went on in the first place instead of learning step one, pour this into that beaker, step two. Where is that curiosity? Build it in right at the beginning. Uh, by the way, we call these anticipatory sets. I call them entry points. Some people call them provocations. Ian Bird, who's a wonderful gate guru, calls them puzzlements. Whatever they are, they provide challenge. They provide buy-in. They provide motivation. And it really is a part of the well-crafted inquiry unit. Um, the paper bag is called an artifact bag. That's by a gal named Paige McCord. Um, because I teach ancient civilizations, I will put artifacts. Mind you, they're small toys I bought on Amazon. But I'll put like Egyptian artifacts in, some samples of papyrus, you know, a toy scare beetle. And the students have to observe them. I have taught them nothing. But they use their powers of observation to draw some conclusions and ask some questions. Even showing a TED Talk or a Brain Pop video doing a virtual field trip. If you're like me at middle school, we can't go anywhere. It's just not possible. But take a virtual field trip. What is your teacher up to? The kids need to know why is she doing this? Why could I possibly be doing this? And of course, there's something, um, the top left corner shows you something like um, the marshmallow challenge or build a bridge. All those are fun if you do them before instead of after. And you're going to have a ball. Oh, and by the way, take pictures. They're adorable. And document your journey. We okay so far? So I'm going to keep moving. Okay, if you tuned in last week, Hillary Wolcott gave you the universal themes and cross-cutting concepts. I'm going to give them to you again. When you get the presentation from Lisa, you will be able to click on these. Um, otherwise, if you're hot to get them, email me after and I'll just shoot them right over. The universal themes, I want you to look at these closely. These are our big ideas. And honestly, because we're about to get into driving questions for inquiry, you must understand that these are large concepts, big ideas. These are themes that apply not just to content or standards. It applies to life in general. You think about politics today, the use and abuse of power. You talk about conflicts in the world today, the conflicts that kids have with each other. Um, I'm a mother of teenagers. Talk about conflict. Um, building community in your classroom, building community at large. So these are all issues that cross over curriculum and go out and about in the world. And if you are um, into the next generation science standards, which Hillary also talked about, she talked about the cross-cutting concepts, which I'm so pleased to see because Sandra Kaplan and her universal themes have been around for a long, long time. And it's really nice to see inquiry back into science and having these cross-cutting concepts, which are very, very similar to universal themes. And I, and I, I would say use them interchangeably 
for instance, systems and system models blend beautifully with the systems. So I highly recommend that, and I'm going to press you on those when we get to the next level. All right. Hold on your hats, guys, because now we're going to talk about driving questions. You cannot do inquiry properly without a high-level, deep, broad, concrete or abstract driving question. They are open-ended, yet totally focused on inquiry, on what you need to know, the problem you need to solve, the needs you have to meet. It should be provocative. It should not, you cannot Google a driving question. It's not a yes or no answer. It is provocative in the sense that it might be controversial. That's exciting, especially for the gifted child. They are open-ended, and what your kids are going to have a hard time with is the fact that these questions may not ever be answered. And a driving question may actually lead to more questions, which for me personally is so exciting because you watch the kids frust be frustrated, and but it's like a really good, healthy frustration. Um, kids today just want answers quickly, and life is not about that. So I, I think that this really parallels real life in the sense that sometimes questions lead to more questions. Sometimes one problem that you solve opens up another can of worms entirely. Also, um, the driving question is linked to the essence, to the core of what you want students to learn within your curriculum, and that's legit. You're, you are allowed to have a very highly focused, content-dependent driving question. I'll give you some examples of that in a second. So here are some examples. Um, when is war justified? That's very abstract. Um, some kids will say, no, war is wrong. But your job is to present some, play devil's advocate. But what happens if you're being attacked? What happens if you're being invaded? Do you have the right to defend yourself? And then what you have, because you've taught your students a scholarly discussion, is how to have that argument as a debate instead of an actual argument. And as you know, the standards um, do ask you to have um, an argument, a structured argument. Your problem, your need to meet can be as simple as, is our water safe to drink? Um, one of the elementary schools that I have been to, they have a creek, and the kids want to know, could they drink the water? The question is, well, could you? Let's find out. Um, mathematics tends to be left out of inquiry, and I, and I really think that's a shame, because mathematics is a language to express ideas in other disciplines. And so a proper concrete driving question can be, how does mathematics express ideas in other disciplines? It is a language to be learned. How can one express other ideas, such as scientific ideas, honestly, historical ideas, using mathematics? So I love that one. And the next is mine. This is what I use generally, and I have given this to my students. Um, and within that, they develop their own driving questions. What is a civilization, which is my sixth grade ancient history curriculum, but it is attached to what does it mean to be civilized? And if you notice the difference, what is a civilization is something that could be answered. They can look it up in the book. They can Google it. God help them. There are six traits of civilization. But what does it mean to be civilized is a question that is debatable. It is provocative. It is abstract. And it has different answers. And it can also lead to other answers. Because we are a first world country in the United States, do we always act in a civilized manner? So um, that's one of my fave questions. Um, you can have a driving question focused on problem solving. How might we reduce litter? And I have um, a lunch club going, I want to say, for six years now. Every year we have kids who really want to reduce litter on campus to the point where we've donated hundreds of dollars to charity. We've made some changes, um, and we'll talk about civic action and service learning later. The kids were upset about something, so I said, what are you going to do about it? And they said, what can we? And I said, you tell me. And so we ended up really making some changes uh, district-wide. And again, a need to meet. Think about the anxiety um, kids have today with homework load and, and our kids are overscheduled. How can you reduce anxiety among your peers? These are cool questions. Like I said, abstract or concrete. Um, are you all okay with driving questions? This is heady stuff for sure. Um, and if you have any that you're using, I would love for you to share them. If you want to throw one out that you're not sure about, I can give you my two cents worth on it. Um, you know, I try to give you elementary examples, as someone said, primary ones, primary ones are so great, um, especially the little ones focus on um, community. It is a great driving question. What is community? It's okay to have one driving question that what does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to make a friend and be a friend? And again, if you, you think about those universal themes, one is relationships. 
So how can we improve our relationships with others to build a stronger community? And for the little ones, it's actually easier to them because they don't see the barriers of, of color and, and income and, and gender that older kids tend to do. So the littles, um, what does it mean to be a friend? How can we make the world a better place? And they can just do little things around the classroom, around the school that really bring them together. And um, you can even do a systems. Um, high school is wonderful. You know, the AP and honors classes tend to do a lot of driving questions, but kind of in the pursuit of doing the essay. Um, please don't leave out the kids who are not qualified as gifted or um, the kid, by asking more questions, they're going to ask you more questions, and they're going to come up with some really profound, profound inquiries. Um, technology is a wonderful uh, driving question. What is the Im impact of technology on ourselves and our peers? And when you talk about impact, which is one of the constant imperatives that never makes it on the chart, one of my favorites, by the way, um, is technology good or bad? And as an ancient history uh, teacher, technology is when you rub two sticks together and make a fire. Okay, so kids tend to think technology is just plugged in. So when you look at the impact of technology on relationships, ooh, I love that one. Thank you, Carla, because you made me think about technology. You made me think about the constant imperative of impact and the universal theme of relationships. What is the impact of technology on our relationships? Wow, think about that. Okay. That's a cool one. Thank you. So that's, if you guys throw them out there, we're going to put something together. We're going to put something together to get, you know, all of it. Okay. All right. I said I was going to overwhelm you before. Now I really, really mean it. This is a process that I have learned. And I do this without technology. Now we're just talking about technology. I do this without technology. I really, really like my kids to move and groove. I use sentence strips. I use thumbtacks. Yes, I give a special lesson on how to use a thumbtack properly. Um, you can use your cabinets. You can use your floors. Um, I happen to have a large room. If you have a small room, use the tabletops. Use what you have. Make it work for you. Um, to have the kids develop their own driving questions, I give them a topic. And so uh, the picture you're looking at, I want to say this was, gosh, I think it was my science class. I'm not sure. They have already graduated. So I give them a topic. Let's say um, I give them a topic of systems because I happen to have up my sleeve that we're going to study biomes and ecosystems that, of course, I haven't told them. They write all the questions they could possibly think about that have to do with systems. It could be respiratory. It could be political systems. And, of course, I teach sixth grade. It could be expiratory systems because you know how kids are. They write their questions down, they put them all over the room, then quietly the kids do a read around. Everyone has to read everyone's question. Then when they see questions that are repeated or related, they will put them together. Repeated questions go on top of each other, related questions get grouped together. We're, you're going to see a leveling up of thinking because now we're identifying commonalities and we're grouping. Next. When we truly have those categories, we name them, we label them. This one might be about the rainforest. This might be about the respiratory system. This might be about the political system. And what I will do is I will start, because I have content to cover, I will start steering them towards more of the um, life science perspective of biomes and ecosystems. We identify those commonalities. We have labeled these categories by top. We're talking like a one word label. Here's where you bust out your universal theme. You're going to bust out your universal theme. I already know in my head that I'm going to talk about systems, but that, that's not for, I've told them the topic, but what about the systems? And this is where the kids apply relationships, impact, power, force, um, structure, and function. And when I give these to them, and I introduce them in a lesson, I have them in my room at all times because they come up all the time, then they start putting those categories, they bump it up a notch. So let's say the kids have a bunch of questions about the rainforest. And what happened in my class is they had a bunch of questions about pollution. This was a big concern for them. Global warming was all, you know, over the news at the time. And so I introduced them to impact, which is a content imperative. And I gave them systems and I gave them impact and they put two and two together. What is the impact of global warming on the ocean biome? 
what is the relationship between pollution and global warming in the rainforest. So that kind of thing you use those universal themes. Um, and what happens, I will spend two to three class periods. And so um, I just had a question on it. So it sounds like a lot of time it is so valuable because you have that big idea that they will pursue the entire project, lesson, activity. It is their total focus. It takes me, I can do it now in two periods, but I've done this for a while. Give yourself about three periods. So for me, a period is about 50 minutes. Make it 40 minutes by the time everyone gets in and calms down. Um, if you don't have sentence strips, girl, cut some paper. Use post-it notes. I don't like post-it notes because I like everything big for everyone to see everything everywhere. And I do not use technology. I want kids moving all around the room. Are we all okay with this? This is a huge thing. It's an important thing. And I will tell you, it's fun. The kid who writes something dumb sticks out like a sore thumb. Very, very few management problems. I will tell you that right now. Everyone is so into it that... Uh, Bad behavior is, literally is not an issue. Um, it is an introductory activity to developing the driving questions. You really can't go through the rest of the phases of inquiry without developing and driving questions because you will have no inquiry. Okay? And like I said, give it about, if you're teaching elementary or you have a self-contained classroom all day, give yourself a good two hours, you know, and then take a break if you need to come back and finish cool. I mean, if I could follow it through in a day, I certainly would. Okay? But for me, because I'm at the middle school, about three class periods will be plenty. And that's a lot of discussion and really deep discussion and a lot of thinking. So real quickly, I'm not gonna read all of these, but what I want you to we want you to understand, these are actual questions my students develop. Some of them are higher level than others and I have um, clusters of gifted students. So you will see that some of these, I can tell who was in which group, of course I also remember, but. Uh, if you look at group one, how do humans impact wetlands? How do wetlands impact humans? What happened is while the kids were pursuing one part of the question, they realized that certain biomes actually produce things of use to humans. So they actually, all on their own, a couple groups flipped things around. So the, um, we were very concerned as a class how humans are negatively impacting biomes, rainforest, ocean, things like that. And then through their research, they realized, for instance, the rainforest produces a lot of things that humans need. So then they were thinking, well, how does the rainforest or how does the, how do the wetlands impact us as humans? And I'm like, great question. And they said, can we pursue it? And I said, I don't know, can you? And they, will, they said, well, yeah, we can. Again, put it back on them. So, and that actually allowed a great division of labor naturally. Um, within that group of four, we had two kids who wanted to do humans impacting wetlands and the other two wanted to do wetlands impacting humans. They got together, they got to discuss it. It was cool. For kids who might not be at that level, we had um, simply compare and contrast different ocean zones. Really important information. Um, ocean zones are pretty um, unfamiliar to most kids and they were able to compare and contrast. And so again, through that driving question, you can differentiate. All right, and um, ethical issues, God, I love that one. It's, it's so ripe for controversy, which I love, especially in middle school. Um, the contributions of the rainforest, you know, again, try to be intentional about working in the icons, the universal themes, and the content imperatives. And again, um, you can just pick my brain all you want um, afterwards, and I will, I will help you craft some studying of it. Okay, now. Don't freak out because remember I told you, you're on the beach, you're either sticking your toe in, someone was waist deep, someone was swimming underwater scuba diving, hey, cool. Um, there are different types of inquiry. And what I mean by that, inquiry is one thing, but you can do a mini inquiry. Um, if you're in elementary in particular, you may have a wonder wall. And what's really great about that, I don't know if you have any kids who just love to ask you questions to the point where you can't get anything done. A wonder wall is a great place. Uh, it's well stocked with post-its and pencils. And that child who has constant questions gets to put them on a wonder wall. And I do use post-its because I want to reuse my wonder wall. But um, a wonder wall is a place for students to put their questions when you um, may not have time, um, when they may have excessive curiosity, I'll put it that way. And um, they put their question there. They can either pursue their question later when they have some time available or what's even cooler is another kid can pick up that question and they can pursue it. 
or the coolest is that a couple kids can pursue it together. And, and I'm going to get back to mini inquiry in a second. Literature circle inquiry, if you, if you are like me, I am curriculum driven. I only have so much time. So for instance, we're reading The Giver right now. We just finished it. And we're just doing some post uh, reading activities. What we will be doing is bringing in Shirley Jackson's A Lottery. Just so you know, that's a 10th grade text, but I will be using it in six because of what it's about. Um, a short film uh, called 2081. It's based on Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. And of course, good old Twilight Zone. Number 12 looks just like you. So uh, multiple texts, varying reading abilities, viewing abilities. And it's a different way to pursue the driving question, which I also use for the giver, which is, what does it mean to be civilized? And as you know, the giver, or you may not know, is um, a dystopian novel. So I can get that done um, in, in fits and spurts if I cannot do inquiry all the time. Curricular inquiry, um, this third model here is where I spend most of my time because, like I said, I have content to cover. And... Um, Open inquiry is your genius hour, your 20% time. If you do have the freedom to do that, highly recommend it. And that's where the wonder wall will come back where kids pursue their own interests. Um, I'm just going to skip over this slide. I just want it here for you as a resource, different ways to do mini inquiries when you have time. And again, if you're on the beach, this is what you want to want to dabble in. Okay. Um, again, um, because I talk way too much. I am going to give you these resources here for Literature Circle Inquiry. You gather text. Um, I love Newzella, by the way, because it varies uh, reading abilities and their short text. Videos, podcasts, speeches, film, so many different ways to read around a topic, to view around a topic. Highly recommend it, and it really honors the kid's interest level and ability level. Now, a unit focus. We all have units to teach. When I was uh, using my systems example when I taught science, what I found out through questioning is I had kids who didn't know what a biome is. They certainly didn't know if a biome was a system. So guess what? Formative assessment for me. I had to start with some basic research. Then they wanted to know what are the systems within, and of course the kids selected a biome because that's what we do. We all have to do a poster on a biome. I got rid of the poster. I did a di um, an inquiry project instead. What are the systems within a given biome? How did those subsystems interact within that biome? And then my kids were just fascinated by human impact and global warming. That was their take that year on that particular driving question. Who am I to stop them? That's what they're interested. I got to teach you standards. Boom. Everybody's happy. I want to show you what I'm up to this year. I'm trying a year-long focus in social studies. I am very into action advocacy where the kids do something um, to change the world. So I am using something called Sustainable Development Goals, which I highly recommend you look into. And if you're too lazy, just email me. I'll give you everything. Because we are in prehistory. Who were we? And I'm building awareness of who we are as people. Who were we as people? Um, what are other people's lives like around the world? Then this time of year, we're starting to advocate for others. Be a voice for the voiceless. Who are we as people? And then um, in spring, we're each going to take some of those goals, whether it's ending poverty, reduced inequalities, gender equality, climate action, and we're going to start to advocate. And the question is, who will we be uh, as future adults? Um, what kind of history will we make? And so I'm really trying to blend my uh, inquiry focus throughout my social studies curriculum, and I will get back to you on that. So far, it's okay. All right. You want to go whole hog, people? Work with your team. And plan inquiry across the disciplines. If you um, are elementary, you can literally do this yourself. It's nice to have a team help you. Um, I teach language arts and social studies, so I try to integrate as much as possible. But what if you got together with your team and you had a grade level driving question, conflict creating change? Imagine all the things you could do there. So that's an example for you that gets me really excited. Um, technology. So look, folks, um, tech is a tool. If you don't use tech, you're still a good person. I will be friends with you. What you need to realize is you don't use tech for tech's sake because it's new and shiny and because someone bought you something fancy. You use it because it's in the service of something you need to accomplish. What are you already doing that you could do better or differently with technology? If you have a speaking standard that you don't hit, use Flipgrid, where kids can have conversations, video conversations. You can use Seesaw to do the same thing. Push out your work through Google Classroom. 
especially share documents for groups doing inquiry. Um, have kids create a podcast, have kids um, listen to a podcast, have kids blog, create a Google site, but all of those tech tools are because it matches the purpose of what they want to do. And um, I feel strongly about that because it's new and shiny doesn't mean it's appropriate. And so just please don't use tech for tech's sake. And I could go on about this, but that's not really what we're here for. Okay. Now, I've mentioned this a couple times. Help yourself as, a, as an educator pursue an inquiry stance. When the kids are complaining, pursue that complaint. What bothers you? Well, the kids are littering and they're leaving my desk a mess. What are you going to do about it? The kids can say, I don't know. What can I do about it? Put it back on them. What can you do about it? They're going to ask you, what well, can we protest? I don't know. Can you? Let me show you how to write a letter to the editor. Let me show you how to address someone with something that concerns you in a way that makes them want to listen. And guess what, folks? Those are your language arts standards. How to write persuasively. All right? So, content's what you teach. The standards are how you teach it. To empower your students, gifted or otherwise, is why you teach. You get bored easily. Your students get bored easily. They want to know why they have to do that. You put it back on them. Why do you have to do that? All right? Ask them. Have them pursue it. The driving question, I think I've talked about this a lot, but it will um, focus everything you do. Everything you do is in the service of that driving question. It will help you with your planning. Um, it's not necessarily backwards planning with the UDL method, if you're familiar with that. But um, you start with that driving question, you think about your end result, and then you go back in. Always think about, you guys, why are you doing this? And you're, by the way, you're not doing it to check off standards, okay? Investigation, if you're concerned about the meat of inquiry, here it is, guys. Here is the research phase. It's annotation, taking notes. It's building background, sharing background. It's how to listen. It's how to view. It's how to have a refined focus on those questions. It is how to assess the various resources, um, articles, texts for validity, credibility, reliability of sources. This is how we confer with our team members. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is the meat of teaching. This is your standards. This is direct explicit instruction, and it has a very, very appropriate place within inquiry. It is not all we do, but it is teaching on demand. It is teaching purposefully, and it's okay to teach everyone at once, I promise you. Some more mini lessons for you. I won't go on and on about this. I just uh, want to have these here for you because if nothing else, I want you to have that information. And I've mentioned some of them such as um, disagreeing agreeably and again, how to conduct research. Um, there's something called, pardon my French, the crap test. Um, it, it's credibility, reliability, accuracy. Um, I'm trying to get together A and um, purpose. I can give you a copy of that too, but it's really fun. And of course, I rearrange the letters in middle school because it's not appropriate. All right. Think like a scholar. How many of you have are familiar with uh, TLAD? Uh, think like a disciplinarian. You can just tell me I am or no or what the heck are you talking about? What you do with the gifted child and with all your children is when you are researching something in history, you are a historian. What is the language? What are the tools a historian will use? Or a scientist or um, an archaeologist or an economist. When you're studying a particular aspect of your driving question, put on that hat. Think like that scholar. How you um, identify your vocabulary, your academic vocabulary, how you respond, how you communicate is in the guise of that scholar. And again, it's bumping up your curriculum to the next level. And I can, again, I can give you more information on that. I feel like I'm just Telling you to email me, please do. Um, assessment, um, and folks, I am not talking about testing them to death. I am talking about to check for their understanding along the way through non-graded activities that are informative. They will tell you what you need to reteach. They will tell you what you can skip, what you can advance, how to differentiate. These can be 2D mod. They can kids can build their understanding. They can answer using a Google question. They can put their thoughts on a Padlet. They can respond on Flipgrid. They can actually just have an, a live conversation with you. Um, I highly recommend um, putting their work on the walls, but it's work in progress. You give them a concept map at the beginning of the unit. You give them the same concept map in the middle and then at the end, and you see how they have added to their thinking. 
it's a really, really cool display of a thought process. I'm very into working walls instead of just static displays of work. Um, I take stuff up, put stuff down, cover it with chart paper. The walls are for us to use to work and show our thinking. And your job is to observe, to read, to take anecdotal notes, and to plan your lessons accordingly as formative assessments. Um, gearing towards the end now, you have pursued your driving question. You found some possible answers, some possible solutions. Now what? Whether you choose to make a thing, hopefully it's a thing with purpose, a demonstration of what the students have learned, you want to develop criteria together, and I'll show you um, a rubric we made together in a second. How will your students demonstrate their understanding? You can tell them what to do. Everyone make a Google Slides presentation, or you can, which I don't love, but you can give them a variety of choices. They can choose on their own if you'd like free choice. Um, but no matter what, what they use to show what they know must match the purpose. Because they know how to make a Google Slides presentation really pretty doesn't mean it's appropriate for what they, they've learned. How they share with others, will they present to the school board? My students did that. Will they um, ask a panel of experts to come in? Or will they Skype with a panel of experts, which we've had to do because we were um, trying to communicate with uh, an organization in New York. We obviously can't go to New York. Um, have the kids reflect. Google questions are great for that, or even just an exit slip. How has your learning changed, increased? What did you used to know? What do you think you know? What questions do you have now? And then do something. What are you going to do about it? My kids are mad about pollution, so I said, pick it up. Do something. What do you want to do? And they did. Kids can do amazing things, and your gifted child is, is so well suited for being an advocate for others. They have that inner drive. They are your leaders, they're organizers, and now that you've helped them build their social skills and communication skills, they are the ones that we can look to to really take charge and share leadership because you're helping them do that. And these are things that everyone can do. And if you look at these examples of kids as change agents, I bet you can identify a number of standards. Look at all the common core standards, writing for authentic audiences, incorporating um, statistics and data into a status report, identifying appropriate research to use to persuade a school board to make a policy change. Think about this. These are real applications of the standards you might normally teach artificially, and that's why I absolutely love inquiry. This is just a quick picture of a rubric we have developed together, and this is um, a negotiation that the kids and I had because I was, I was honest. Hey, kids, I have to grade you on certain things based on my standards. You have to be able to identify a biome. You have to know um, food chains, food webs, things like that. Those are my standards. But what else do we need to know? If our driving question is how do systems interact, what do we need? What criteria do we need to show that? And this is just a quick example of what we brainstormed together. And then I drew up a format, submitted it to the kids, we fine-tuned it, and then we had a final version. So it's kind of cool. We, we co-created this, and that was pretty awesome. All right, so I'm almost done talking. Um, I'm going to give you some great resources here. And I will tell you, Harvey and Daniel, I've actually met them because I'm totally fangirl of them. Um, amazing book. This was my Bible. Stephen Zemelman is a friend and has written the most amazing book. Please check it out. Daniel's an Amit. Anyway, I won't go on and on. But these authors, if you want to read more about inquiry and really how to teach for authentic purposes and for authentic outcomes, I highly, highly recommend these authors. I can give you more. Again, I literally, I, I'm like a mental hoarder. I have everything. You're never going to have enough time. Use that to motivate you. Keep That keeps you on your toes, keeps you thinking on your feet. You'll never have enough time. That's not the reason why you give up. That's the reason why you get her done. And that's what, this is kind of like my, my guiding principle. And of course, I love Leonard Bernstein too. I am done. I want to thank you guys. You can be thinker or you can be the doer and I'm going to tell you all since we're all at the beach together get in that water if you have to wear a wetsuit do it get wet go for a swim I, I'm there I will be your life preserver when needed and thank you thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much Vanessa thank you all for logging in um, Vanessa if you want to take just a minute and scroll through your chat panel and see if maybe there's one question that uh, you feel would be good to answer before we wrap up. Um, and then for all of you who are logged in, if you had any questions that we weren't able to get to, please again, feel free to email them to us um, 
I'll leave my contact information here on this next slide. Feel free to email me after the webinar is over and I will be happy to forward it on to Vanessa. We will also be sending out a webinar recording link so that you can review this webinar at a later date. That should be going out later this week or early next week. And I know that the presentation was jam-packed full of great information. Um, so you'll have that recording to rewatch. And then also we will be providing a link to the slides. So you may have noticed some of Vanessa's slides had hyperlinks on some of the words. When I send the slide deck out to you all, you will be able to click on that hyperlink to get to those resources. Vanessa, any question that came up that you feel like would be a good way to end, end the webinar? Um, yeah, I see a couple. Um, one um, person has asked, when you come up with your inquiry question, what do you allow the students to use for resource? I will tell you I'm a big fan of curating resources. My students are not allowed to free Google, as I call it, until they absolutely have to. Um, I will curate some resources that I've vetted. Um, I will um, also vary reading abilities. That's why I like Newzella but I will go through a list. I'll usually um, push it out to Google Classroom so they can link and do some initial research. That way I am in control of the fact that I, I know that they will get the basics of information to cover the content standards. And then if they need to go further, I'm all over that because I've also done many lessons on how to do an effective web search, how to assess sources for reliability, accuracy, bias, and things like that. So again, those are all the mini lessons that I do for them. Um, so can we give the guiding question or students come up with it? I'm going to tell you if you're new, give yourself permission to give the driving question. Our seventh grade does that. They, their driving question year long is how does conflict create change? Within that driving question, the kids will come up with more area specific ones if they're doing the Holocaust or something like that. Give yourself permission to do that. But that method I showed you with the sentence strip, ultimately that is the students crafting their driving questions. And again, that's what you want. You want to put the power with the kids. Wonderful. Great answers. Thank you so much. Vanessa, I want to thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us on the best practices in inquiry PBL to promote deeper learning and critical thinking. Um, thank, thank all of you for logging in and being so engaging and interacting with us through the chat panel. Um, we appreciate all of your questions. Again, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar is over if you think of anything later on. Um, hopefully you'll join us next week on the same day and time as we continue our series with untapped potential, powerful strategies to enhance the learning of twice exceptional students. If you haven't already, please feel free to register for the webinar at this link on the slide. Thank you again for your participation and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.